Thank you so much, uh, Jitinda, for joining me uh, today in this conversation. Um, the current situation in uh, America seems to have exposed um, underlying racism um, again in our societies. And I know that when you set up Tara Arts uh, 42 years ago, or 43 years ago, it was in response to um, a racist murder um, of um, Gurdeep Singh Chagar. And you worked with your friends to set up as, as a form of activism. Um, so I wanted to ask how you would use that drive to create theatre and shape um, what you're doing. Oh, big question. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is that clearly what's going on in, in, in America right now is something that uh, is extremely tragic and certainly reminds so many of us who are not white skinned uh, of the horror that surrounds us uh, in certain societies. Uh, in America, this is a fault line of race uh, which comes about as a result of slavery, um, which is, as a society, it's still dealing with. Where it's relevant here is that our own uh, official response to race, this is the British government, really is as a result of what's going on in America. Okay. It's only in the 60s uh, as civil unrest uh, became more... Uh, visible around the world and we were beginning to get those early migrations of uh, people from the Caribbean and from India and Pakistan. Uh, it's, it's at that point that people started to kind of think oh my god you know we might have a kind of problem here as well and part of it is sort of based on this absolute sort of racist fallacy all black people look the same, therefore they'll behave in the same way. Uh, so, I mean, that's just been our relationship to, to America. I think for us, uh, and it, as it happened, it was a kind of summer, summer day, uh, rather like the one that we're experiencing now in 1976, uh, when this young boy got killed, uh, Gurdeep Singh Jagar in Southall. And it seemed, it's, there were sort of two things about that. Uh, which at the time was as graphic as the images that we've been looking at today of this uh, policeman with his knee on the neck uh, of this guy, George Floyd. Uh, and what was equ equally sort of graphic was that Gurdeep Singh Chagar was killed at seven o'clock uh, in summertime, which means it was daylight. Hmm. And he was killed in an area of London, which was supposed to be a kind of little India, South Pole. And, and with all the connotations that this is a safe place. And suddenly, and I know I felt it, and I, 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 you know, it was something which was felt throughout the country. Anyone who was Asian or Black, you had this instinctive sense they but for the grace of God go I. It could have been me. 
so inevitably, as a kind of young person, you're looking to see, well, how do I respond to this? Now, interestingly, uh, when we were kind of reflecting on this event, we said two things to ourselves. One is that racism is not our problem. We may be the victims of it, but we did not create it. And the second is that racism is not a policy. It's a cultural matter. It's in the air. You ain't going to change it simply by saying, don't do it, or legislating against it. It is a bent of the mind. And therefore, it's an act of imagination. And so in a way, for us, it became important that we need to exercise imagination in responding to it. And that if we don't, we will be limiting ourselves to effectively uh, only dealing with a topic that has been prescribed for us, mm -hmm. race. Uh, and so in a way, I suppose that that began the road of us saying that the way to handle, at times, uh, contemporary events, contemporary kind of problems, is elliptically, uh, is via metaphor, is through a state of suggestion rather than direct confrontation. Now, I don't think that that's, uh, that's always the case. And even in, in, in my own case, um, you know, I, I have at times been quite sort of direct. But it was this kind of feeling that really you can't pursue art as a political object, as a political process. Hmm. Now, it's a fine line because at the same time, we were absolutely aware that all art is political. Whatever you do, you do a gesture in space in front of a hundred people, you are making a statement about yourself, about your gender, about what you look like, about the nature of that intersection uh, of a gesture in a blank space, uh, let alone choosing to do that. So there are kind of po uh, political choices constantly being made. Uh, but I suppose what we were concerned about is that it's not quite like uh, being on a soap, uh, soapbox opera. Uh, you know, it's not quite that. Uh, what we knew some of our friends were doing, which was actual activism on the streets and trying to kind of uh, develop things like the um, uh, Asian youth movements. Uh, those are sorts of things that were happening, which we knew we couldn't quite do. Uh, our, interest was in the imagination in how that is reinforcing a certain sense of who we are and therefore to use theater or use the performing arts as a way to counter those things mm -hmm. and so it's not incidental that the first project we did first play was an adaptation of a play written by Tagore who was the first Asian first non-European to have won the Nobel uh, Prize for Literature uh, and it's actually in his work, we saw something which could, which echoed what was going on for us in, in Britain. Yeah. And in that work, you were, um, in terms of that process, so it's very clear where that drive was coming from and this sort of act of imagination to activate uh, uh, audiences into action through thinking. Um, but in that work, in the process you were working with, you were using Sanskrit theatre and uh, using, um, am I right in saying this, you were using aspects of Nati Shastra and dramaturgy from that to develop your theatre work in terms of the processes you were working with? Yes. I mean, the whole thing about the Nati Shastra is an interesting one in that, you know, after the first four or five years, we, we kind of hit a stage saying, what makes us an Asian theatre company. Mm. And truth be told, the only thing that sort of, at the moment we could say, defines the Asian theatre company is the fact that we are all of the same colour. 
But actually, we're not putting our own languages on stage. We are not using forms which may not be the same as European forms. And that's really what led to an investigation. It started with, in, in, with, a, with an actual study of Bollywood cinema to see, well, what is it? Leave aside the kind of pap. What is it as a form? that is so attractive to so many millions. And you, know, you realize, my God, in the best of them, they tell a story using dance, using music uh, in, a, in, a, in a very compelling way. And that was our step to the Natyashastra, where you see that that's kind of codified. And I still believe that it offers a, a, a very kind of truthful view of what performance art is. Uh, that it is not real, but it is really felt. Mm -hmm. I'm quoting here, uh, there was a, a wonderful uh, 14th century literary critic called Abhinava Gupta. Mm -hmm. And he defines drama as, drama is like a dream. It is not real but it is really felt. And that is, to me, that's exactly uh, what uh, Western European theater has been aspiring to. We all know it's a fiction, mm. but what we aspire to is a reality of feeling. Uh, we come at it from different pathways. Um, the other thing that I absolutely, uh, love about uh, the Natya Shastra, or what it offers uh, along with various other Asian theatres, is what I was saying earlier that it's honest. It doesn't, it doesn't sort of lie to you. Uh, and in part it is because there is a performer and the performer is saying lines, being emotional, dancing, singing, is a total magician. Yeah. It's all happening in front of your eyes. And it's, I, I find that, um, again, this uh, sort of Eurocentric approach of uh, categorization isn't something that's uh, really existent in Bharatanatyam and, and therefore in the sort of um, the only way to put it is Asian thinking. There, there is a um, interconnectedness between these practices that are understood from a deeper sense in terms of their principles and how you utilize them, but they're not separated into these kind of artistic genres. But what I'd sort of would like to hear from you is I've, um, working as, as theatre director and coming from that perspective how do you or what are the things that you see as being difference between um, the dancing body and the acting body very good question and pushed at it I, I would say it's a difference of emphasis the acting body is primarily its pri primary tool is the voice to uh, to convey emotion. For the dancer, the primary tool is the body to convey emotion. So both are trying to do the same thing, which is tell a story, convey an emotion, but they're tools, the emphasis on the tools is slightly different. Now that I've seen over the years that where th there are certain types of dancers as well as actors who can't do both. Mm -hmm. uh, so that the, 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 say for example, the, the actors sort of uh, Whole emphasis on vocal characterization and from which physical characterization comes makes it such that at times they recoil at the somewhat um, 
stylized, uh, non-natural approach of dancers. Uh, and it's a different kind of headspace. Similarly, I've seen dancers who are fantastically eloquent physically, uh, but because they've never had to use this, the vocal cords are terribly weak when the voice opens. Uh, so I, I, I think that for me, those are, those are the kind of um, criticals, amongst the criticals of points of difference. We both work in a three-dimensional space within which to try and convey uh, emotion. Both are also not emoting for their own sake, but for the sake of a spectator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's no point in me crying. And that's why a lot of directors say to, to actors, don't cry on stage. Mm -hmm. That's not the job. The job is to make the audience cry. Absolutely. Uh, uh, but that's really what we're about. We're about trying to convey a, a, a mood, a feeling, a story to an audience where we become a vessel. And for me, that, that notion of the vessel which in Sanskrit is patra, again coming from uh, Natya Shastra, I, I think is one of the most magical of all concepts. Mm -hmm. That performers, I've always believed that they are the only magicians, the only priests uh, of humanity. And that is because they have through a combination of natural talent and training, made themselves into a vessel which can uh, convey the words or the feelings of someone else. And that's such a powerful, such a powerful, uh, and so such a difficult uh, thing to achieve, uh, which is why I think uh, there, there are no more skilled people than performers. Mm. And just coming back to the way you were working, I, from in terms of the work you've developed uh, over the last four decades, um, how have you seen the shift in your practice and and what has that um entailed um I'm, and i'm sort of particularly keen to hear from it in terms of uh um a, a practice in terms of uh your areas of focus as you moved through because every every artist evolves as a working because their um, areas of interest are to um zone in if you will um i'm just very curious to hear over four decades how that has been shaped for you yeah i think in part i was fortunate in that uh in in, in the kind of time that i grew up uh, with the company you know there was it was a relatively kind of open field you know, there was no one else around so you actually just continue to pursue things that were of interest to you uh, and so that meant that there was a lot of work which was also very contemporary, whether it was looking at immigration or school and so on and so forth. But also that you were able to look uh, at the classics. And I'd say that for me now more and more, it's that, that that's the most enduring thing. Uh, you know, either the classic in itself or as an adaptation uh, to now. And part of it, for me, I, I is that I think for a dancer, rather like for a musician, there is a uh, there is a technique. You know, either you can do it or you can't. It's as simple as that. Uh, if you can't play the note, well, you're not a musician. Uh, if you can't do a plie, a plie, you're not a dancer or, or whatever other kinds of forms. You know, I, I know there are different forms of, of dance, but basically if you can't follow rhythm, you're not a dancer, end of the matter. For an actor in the West, there is no system. 
it's kind of wide open. Um, yeah, you can you can follow Lecoq or you can follow Stravinsky or uh, Stanislavski, uh, but it doesn't like it's not like uh, in uh, in in lots of parts of Asia with the traditional forms. There is a particular method, mm -hmm. and that makes you the performer. Right, and you, know, you kind of concentrate on that Kathakali or Kuriyata or no theater or Beijing opera. You know, that's a technique. And so curiously, I found that here, for me, looking at the classics became a way of looking at the technique of the actor. Mm -hmm. The great thing about the classic is that every time you hear that line, whatever the line is, to be or not to be, or whatever, or whatever the lines are, you know it's been said by hundreds of thousands over 400 years at least. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the Greeks, well, you know, it's thousand years. You go to the Sanskrit theater, again, it's thousands of years. And that means that you are standing on the back of some tradition, for want of a better word. But the thing is, what makes the classic endure is that However, the writers did it, they achieved a sort of perfection of form, uh, which you can mess around as much as you like, but it endures for that particular story. That's mm -hmm. why people keep on doing it. And so more and more, I began to realize that when you're servicing those texts rather than uh, wanting to kind of rewrite them, in a way, you are trying to get in touch with a certain technique. So amongst the kind of best examples uh, is, is with Shakespeare, that with the verse, it's like a mask. It is there. Your job is going to be to try and fit yourself into the mask rather than for, for the mask to fit you. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me a little bit like in uh, the Bharatanatyam, uh, in the Natya's uh, uh, part of it, you know, it's a story of Krishna or whatever. The dancer's job is to try and fit Krishna rather than to bring Krishna to you. Mm. Again, it's an em emphasis thing. Uh, and so that's why I have begun to enjoy uh, those, uh, the, the, the classics a lot. Uh, a couple of days ago on Sunday, I had this actress, Indra Verma, uh, read a story uh, of Savitri, uh, which is this woman in the Mahabharata who basically wins back her husband from death. Now, it was a very simple story, uh, and she read it beautifully, and you can see it on, on Facebook and so forth, as part of uh, a, a kind of weekend of storytelling in India. But what was very interesting was that as she was reading it, you were aware of the of the of the age of this story and the power of it. Mm. And as she herself said, basically you just had to service that story. And you suddenly come across this astonishing thing of a young woman who a defies her, her father in marrying the person that she wants, and B, then defies death in getting her husband back. Mm. I mean, wonderful. And that's what I mean about, about the classics, that there is, there is a kind of, almost a, it almost encodes a technique, which I think becomes a great conversation. And finally, as a kind of, uh, well, a point on that, uh, the other reason why I'm so my my mind goes there, even with a modern play, I'm looking at the kind of classical overtones of it, is because I think it's too e easy in Britain for a nation or a black person to be reduced to simply the modern work. Yeah. No. I have a history like anyone else has. And I have a past like anyone else has. And so these pasts are mine as well, be they Indian or African or English, whatever they are. 
and that in that way, I am kind of resisting this notion, which is a racist notion, that only this is allowed you. You're only capable of this. Forget it. I'm, why? I'm capable of anything, really. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much, um, Jitinda. I think um, we are, we're um, coming to our time. Um, I could just talk to you for hours, hours and hours. Um, you're just such a wealth of knowledge and I really appreciate you taking time to speak with me. No, John, thank you for your lovely questions, which have allowed me to ramble on for so long. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay.